Alex Miller, Earl Kessler and Chuck Setchell, who are going to give us an update uh, that's named, I think, quite, quite jazzily, from OFTA to BHA. So I believe we're starting with Alex. So I will just hand the microphone to you, Alex, over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having this opportunity for us to discuss some of the new things with USAID's Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, as well as the changing team and the improved, uh, well, I should say, the expanding activities um, that we have for the, for the coming years and months. So um, my name is Alex Miller. I'm the acting team lead for the Shelter and Settlements uh, uh, Division part of the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. I just want to check, um, can everybody see the slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Um, so again, uh, yes, uh, we have um, on our uh, presentation, Let's see if I can do here. Yeah. So number one, meet the team. Uh, we have some new faces. Uh, what is BJ? New mandate and new application guidelines, communications and outreach, annual sector update, quarterly newsletter, special events, FY 2020 and 21 sector spending and team activities, common comments for our implementing partners, which should be interesting, and our 2020 funding proposals, as well as our preview of SNS team guidance notes. So let's begin with our team. And my name is Alex Miller. I'm the Shelter and Settlements Acting Team Lead. Uh, we also have Earl Kessler, a Surge uh, Shelter and Settlements Advisor. You can say hi, Earl. Hi. Okay, thanks, Earl. Uh, again, we have uh, Chuck Setchell, Senior Settlements Advisor. Hi, Chuck. Good morning, afternoon. And we also have Travis Betts. Uh, he's not on the presentation or with us today, but he's our advisor for uh, shelter and health. So we split both ways. So he adds a very interesting component to our reviews. And we also have Christopher Lopez, our program assistant. Hi, Chris. And I believe uh, <laughs> I believe we also have three additional advisors planned uh, for the coming months and years. So we are expanding. The team is getting bigger and bigger with a bigger need. And we ultimately hope to assist our partners and the strategic direction of our, of our sector. Uh, what is Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance? The USAID's Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance is the US government-led coordinator for international disaster response. We reach and will reach more tens of millions of people around the world with life-saving aid. It was created of this year, merging USAID's Office of Food for Peace, FFP, and the US Foreign Disaster Assistance, or OFDA. Office of Foreign Disasters, excuse me, and only USAID Bureau that provides humanitarian aid and sets the foundation for longer term recovery. Our mandate has not changed that much. We still concentrate on saving lives, alleviating human suffering, and reducing the impact of humanitarian crises. USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance provides life saving humanitarian uh, assistance, including food, water, shelter, emergency health care sanitation and hygiene, and critical nutrition services to the world's most vulnerable and hardest to reach people. Our new proposal guidelines or application guidelines have been developed this year. They took in effect uh, October 1st, uh, just over two months ago. Well, excuse me, a month and a half ago. And they are applicable to next year as well as 2022. I highly encourage uh, implementing partners to take a look uh, in terms of shelter and settlements, we have very few um, changes or edits. Uh, we have um, also wanted to focus the structures keyword, which is in there as well. So please do take a look. Um, it is a bit different and a bit more um, uh, expansive considering we've combined two agencies. We also hope to do more communication and outreach in the coming years. Uh, we have three types of newsletters that we're steering uh, internally and externally. We have the annual sector update, uh, which I believe, I hope uh, some of you have taken a look at on our website. We have the quarterly newsletter uh, with, as you can see, our one of our staff members, Lee Mullaney on the front, uh, who we can hope that uh, he can uh, participate again, as well as the World Habitat Day. We are uh, continually trying to pinpoint uh, days where we can concentrate on the settlements uh, part of our, of our sector. And just a snapshot of our fiscal year 2019, more than 4 million in standalone global and regional SNS programs. We had more than 199 million in SNS interventions worldwide by implementing partners. And we're also trying to form more evidence-based academic partnerships as long as our 
as long, uh, excuse me, along with our student fellowship that's been operating for several years and very effective. We took place in 36 countries as well. And next I'll hand it over uh, to Chuck. Thank you, Alex. Uh, review of our fiscal year 2020 activity. Uh, much of this was uh, through the global shelter cluster. Uh, the first one, the working group on urban settlements. Uh, we supported a 10 years on review of the neighborhood approach in Haiti, uh, recently uh, issued a blog article on that. The shelter projects uh, uh, activity that's been going on for several years through the cluster. IEC materials development, a new activity uh, through the cluster. Uh, diaspora disaster risk reduction activity, uh, both through the cluster and through IOM and a shelter and settlements grad student fellowship that we've had for several years now. And we're in the midst of uh, taking a, a, a bit of a hiatus from field work as in light of the pandemic uh, to do a project review, internal project review. Next slide, please, Alex. Uh, some of our activities uh, this last year and then uh, in, the, in the coming months uh, will be a continuation of our training and outreach and advocacy work. Um, some of our online uh, trainings have now uh, reached um, 138 countries and several thousand people have completed the online training. Uh, guidance on plastic sheeting and NFI it was interesting to hear uh, uh, Jim Kennedy and others in the previous session talking about plastic sheeting um, would love to engage uh, on, the, on those issues. Uh, additional guidance on the structures keyword that Alex alluded to, uh, drafting and review of proposal guidelines, which we will continue to uh, uh, update and revise throughout the next couple of years. A roadmap for research um, recently initiated uh, through the Interaction Shelter and Settlements Working Group uh, to focus uh, academic research in the, in the sector of shelter and settlements and also through the Shelter and Settlements Working Group, the publication this last fall uh, of the wider impacts of shelter and settlements. Next slide, please. So some of our common comments, and we'll, we'll, we will um, prepare an update of our 2017 uh, edition. Uh, that is on our website uh, if you want to take a look. Many of the comments will be similar. Uh, Ms. Alex suggested uh, the structures keyword uh, will be upgraded and expanded. Uh, structures in this case are structures that we look at outside of the shelter and settlement sector. Uh, be it in livelihoods or in protection or in ag and uh, food security, uh, other sectors. Uh, uh, we continue to embrace the SPHERE project guidelines. I uh, want to make sure that that's incorporated and reflected in funding proposals. Uh, we insist on uh, bills of quantities and diagrams to, to get a better sense of um, how people are going to be uh, initiating uh, actual work. Um, a, we're pushing back uh, significantly on any support for paint and cosmetic work. Um, this has cost us uh, paint. You, it's amazing uh, how much paint can cost in the course of um, several thousand uh, shelters. Um, it's not a prohibition. It's just a default point um, not to have paint incorporated uh, unless there's extenuating circumstances. Want to have a better idea of how projects, particularly those are cash-based projects, how technical uh, support and guidance will be provided and uh, project monitoring throughout uh, from initiation to, uh, to throughout the duration of the project. Assistance to vulnerable groups. We, we continue to be concerned that uh, some who are less able than others uh, are left behind in, in programming. Uh, we wanna make sure that they are um, really central to um, our assistance efforts. Um, reconstruction, just a quick comment. As some of you know, we do not engage in reconstruction and it's not part of our mandate. Um, it's become quite an issue, particularly in Syria and Iraq. Um, we will continue to push back. Um, so it will be easier for funding proposals not to feature significant um, uh, emphasis on reconstruction. And I think we've all seen um, over the last three or four years is increasing uh, interest and concern about HLP issues uh, in our sector. 
Um, this is, uh, we believe this is central to uh, some of the activities uh, of the sector. And we've recently provided support to the shelter cluster to uh, emphasize and research HLP issues. Uh, next slide, please. Over to you, Earl Kessler, my colleague. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the Shelter and Settlements team is preparing a series of guidance notes that we will hope can bring some uh, level of conformity in terminology and understanding so that when we do receive uh, proposals that we don't have to go back and haggle over, well, what do you mean by this and what do you mean by that? And so the range of these guidance notes, we're breaking it out by component that we think needs to have special attention, and they include the humanitarian construction, really what is it? It's related in much ways to the starting point for uh, recovery. It is emergency in nature, and, and it conforms to the SPHERE standards. NFI assistance, NFI assistance continually needs to be clarified because we just received a proposal from a group that had insisted on including plastic sheeting into their NFI kit. And we have decided that this is um, not, not acceptable, that this can't be done because it doesn't carry with it any of the training or the other activities that are going along to make sure that that plastic sheeting is applied correctly. We're also looking at um, focusing on not just the shelter itself, but we're looking at settlements issues. And the broader issue of settlements and the inclusiveness of what a settlement is and how it relates to additional programming that if we get a good settlement plan going and if we are able to make sure that it really conforms to basic standards, then many of the other programming that can go on, the protection, the child safe spaces, the distribution of activities can be accomplished in a much more um, effective and, and cost-saving manner. We're also going to be issuing uh, guidance on cash-based assistance. Seems to be a modality of choice these days because of the, what is perceived to be the uh, apparent easy distribution and implementation, give them money and let them and turn them loose kind of an attitude. And, and there are things that um, this kind of support needs to be um, better monitored and, and better guided, especially when it comes to shelter, especially in the use of the acquisition of materials and the use of plastic sheeting and anything that relates to that which would be uh, construction or repair or improvement of an existing structure so that they, they, get, they get done in a technically sound manner and, and not to be blown away or burned up or whatever uh, because of the poor installation from the beginning. Coverage has become one of the other big issues that we have uh, decided to focus upon because if you look at the statistics and you, if you look at the way um, programs, the programming activities are being carried out, needs don't seem necessarily to be the guidance for response. And, and coverage, especially in the shelter and settlements area, is particularly, let's just call it honestly, poor. If we get 10, 20% of what is needed, everybody cheers when in fact what about the other 80% that did not get attention? So much of the other guidance areas where people are pushing for more durable, they're pushing for more costly solutions, which would even limit further the coverage that we uh, actually uh, achieve is something that we really need to address. The, the coverage is based upon our interest in shelter opportunity surveys, which re is really the establishment of um, an information base. What do we know? How do we know what we think we know? What are the issues that we can detail? And what is the evidence that we have to be able to look at uh, opportunities? And this really pertains in many ways to experiences that are coming out of the middle income conflict areas of Syria, where much of what is being dis discussed relates more to IDP camps than to the basic uh, damaged or unfinished structures, the apartment blocks that could be perceived of as, uh, as a resource instead of a liability. And our, our hope is that through these SOS surveys that we're able to really identify what those opportunities might be so that we can expand the base for dealing with 
the IDPs and, and encouraging return to site and the rest. Common comments you just heard about from Chuck and the kinds of issues that we will be, um, be addressing and minimally habitable uh, covered living spaces is really where we're, we're starting with is, is in terms of what it is that we would hope the proposals to come to us would be. And, and they conform to the sphere standards, they conform to essentially, basically covering as many people safely and securely as we possibly can. And it all ties together into the, the coverage issue and, and the settlements kinds of uh, questions that we need to address. Next slide, please. Thank you. And if there was any questions, we'll be happy. We'll be happy to answer. Charlie, are you related to the author in any way, or is that a? I wish I were. I wish I were, but I cannot claim that. I'm afraid, Earl. But I oh. can say thank you for an excellent presentation. Well, all you have to do is say yes. And I would go. Wow, that's really interesting. Definitely. And yeah. Just one other. One other comment that's probably uh, verboten for me, but I am living in uh, New Mexico and I'm having a special license plate for my vehicle made. New Mexico, the blue wave state, over. Excellent, thank you, Earl. And thank you, Chuck and Alex for the presentation. Very clear. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in on the chat for you, unsurprisingly, I think from, from Juan um, and perhaps one from Jorn. So, I'm going to ask Juan if you'd like to come online and perhaps ask your question yourself rather than rather than me ask it on your behalf. What do you think? Juan, are you there? Sure. Thanks, Charlie. And thank you so much um, for a great presentation. The question I was asking is that often, I mean, as you know, displacement become more and more protracted and in situation where it's not possible for shelters to be upgraded, um, and that people end up living in tents and plastic sheeting for a long time. Often what we find is that shelter actors are not funded for, say, replacement or repair or upkeep of these shelters. And so therefore we end up as camp managers then having to fill that gap instead. I just wondered whether there's any thoughts or kind of consideration for those as well. I can lead that off. Um, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, unfortunately, we are seeing um, very extended stays in camp-like settings or camps. Um, we are actually providing funding support for this very thing. Um, and it's been, uh, I, I suspect it's, it's an increasing percentage of our budget actually um, to, to look at this. It, it's not something that I am necessarily pleased with. Um, I don't think um, that you know, I, I'm, I'm, as you know, one that that thinks that we should be looking very broadly at shelter opportunities um, in settlements, not just in camps, and to understand um, where we can provide assistance outside of camps, um, outside of camp settings. But I think with regard to your specific question, it is it's becoming more and more of a of an issue um we uh I, I, i'm thinking the northern nigeria camps uh camp settings and how we've um, gone back uh, i don't know it seems like we're on our third or fourth round of shelter repair activity in camps and it's yeah, the the component the percentage share of new shelter vis-a-vis -vis repairing shelter um has shifted it's now it's actually now more repair than new um, and I think some of the early uh, a part of part of the issue I think is some of the uh, that first generation of shelter in camps was the the quality was not very good frankly and and so it um, uh, it was a a fairly low bar of quality uh, to begin with and needed some attention subsequently. Um, I think the quality of, of shelter has improved over time um, so that um, we are seeing uh, um, for, for shelter that's been developed in the last couple of years, a more robust quality. Um, so hopefully the duration of that shelter will be longer than the initial, kind of that first initial wave of, of shelter provision. Over. Others let me, let me have add, a comment. Let me add one. Let me add one. One uh, small comment. First, I want to thank you, Juan, 
for allowing me even to participate because by the time I registered, I was shut out. And you were very gracious and I do thank you for the connection that I could actually work and be a participant in this. Um, but in terms of what you've been, your point, I think there's a lot of things that are coming in in terms of winterization, things that are improvements in existing kinds of structures. Those are things that we are definitely receiving and, and approving uh, proposals that would allow for that, especially in critical areas where you know that if you don't winterize, people are gonna die. And so we don't want that. And so those kinds of things are especially, especially of interest and, and needed. And so our position is that yes, that's something we wish to support over. Sorry. I need to apologize. Thank you, Earl. I think uh, really clear answers. I think Jorn's question in the chat is fairly similar to one's. Maybe they're collaborating somewhere, somehow. Um, right, so right. I, I want to ask you, I'm pretty sure they are. I want to ask you a, a more <laughs> general question, just a little process question. So the changes that you've, you've laid out here um, Feel, feel more like sort of evolution than revolution, certainly. Um, but do you have any plans in place to review these changes to see if this is a course of action you want to continue with? Um, and if so, when? And will your partners that you're, you're involved in funding or working with have an opportunity to feed into that review process? Um, I'll take a, another initial shot at this. Um, it's, as I had mentioned uh, in, in one of the slides, uh, we, we just completed a, a 10 years on review of work that was actually um, uh, conducted by some of our implementing partners. And I think rather than engage in um, much more formal, um, detached, uh, quote unquote, objective evaluations, which tend to take much, much longer and, uh, and tend not to be as granular in analysis as we'd like. Um, we're looking at, um, uh, for example, the Shelter and Settlements Working Group um, at Interaction and, and other actors to help us understand how we can improve project performance over time. So we're, we're reviewing, I mean, one of the most exciting things that, that we see is how, let's go back two or three or five or 10 years after the fact and see what happened. We don't do these retrospective uh, review, project reviews uh, often enough. And I think they're incredibly valuable. And the best part about it is that um, in many cases, the, the initial implementing partners um, are actively involved in that review. Um, so they have the intimate knowledge, they have the, the contacts on the ground, they have the, the host country uh, partners, um, they, they have an understanding of the nuance and the difficulties of the project, and then they can see um, how, how they performed. And to provide some measure of, of objectivity and rigor, um, we, we stick our nose in it in the assessment as well to make sure that we're all above board and, and moving in the right direction. So actually, I, th I think uh, we hope to do more and more of these types of reviews because we need, we need to know how we perform. Over. There's also, there's also the issue of, of the guidance pages. And we would, we would be, I think, I'm speaking for myself anyway, maybe the rest of our team, but that we would be disappointed if all of a sudden we issued them and there was no response whatsoever, positive or negative, to what those guidance issues were. And that we're looking to be as reasonable and yet as consistent as we possibly can to maintain the humanitarian criteria that we all hope is the basis for the decision-making that goes into project development and implementation. So yes, I think there will be, it's not gonna be a reviewer and a peer review and all those kinds of things, but it's gonna be the practitioners are gonna come back to us and the partners are gonna come back to us and they're gonna say, wow, that's really interesting. And have you thought about this? Or if this happens, is this something that is also uh, acceptable? And then we would enter into a dialogue. We don't want to quibble, but we, because we want everybody to be as constructive as they can and comments to be made. But we also are, this is not cast in stone. This is guidance. These are guidance documents. And that, sure. that's what we would hope uh, we could all share with you. Over. Thank you. Thank I, you, I would, uh, Charlie. I'd, I'd like to add um, add a point. 
um, as you know, uh, historically, um, you know, our, what we're now calling legacy OFDA, um, I feel like an old, old man now when I say that, um, uh, legacy um, OFDA, um, the focus, as you know, has, has always been um, on, on shelter and not on camps on IDPs primarily, not on refugees. Our counterpart office at the State Department, uh, uh, PRM, uh, Population Refugees and Migration, really focused on the, the CCCM cluster and, and has funded refugee programs. We have historically in Legacy OFDA, we have not. Um, the, the, um, our great interest um, in, in engaging um, with CCCM, um, over the last few years has been this, uh, as we discussed yesterday, this newfound uh, um, world outside the fence line of camps, and, you know, urban, and, and, and working in this larger uh, realm of settlements. And as, as the cluster does that, um, we want to be as supportive as we can of some of the work that's previously been uh, undertaken by the shelter cluster and to it, it help um, um, hopefully harmonize, you know, uh, uh, coordinate and, and, and mutually support um, those activities. Um, urban, urban, the urban space is very difficult. It's very complex, very challenging, absolutely fascinating. And um, we are living in an urban age. Um, we are in the midst of this massive, massive urban growth. We need to understand that. And I think that it's great that the uh, CCCM um, identified it uh, five or six years ago with their, their out of camp policy to move into that space. And I think that's very, very, very profound. And that's, that's uh, the primary interest that I think that we have going forward with the, with the cluster. Right. Over. right. Thank you. And I think a, a reference there to anyone who wasn't at our urban and out of camp day, uh, which was just yesterday, if my memory serves me right, correctly. Right. It's all merely yesterday. Right. But um, if you weren't and you want to access the recording of that session, which was really good, you can do it via the website. I'm conscious we've got two minutes to go, but some, some guy called yawn has got his hand up. So yawn over to you. Two minutes to ask and answer a question. Thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, it was, of course, because you didn't understand how profound uh, the question really was, because... Uh, also all these layers uh, but uh, it's getting late and uh, let's be quick um, because i care for shelter and i care for shelter as uh, something that uh, keeps people safe and in em emergencies we see that people are given shelters to do to have immediate protection but uh, what we see in more urban context is that somewhere down the line this shelter becomes a home and a home is a place to build from and uh, to develop from so keeping in mind that uh, the average uh, camp life cycle is 17 years these are generations growing up in these hopefully homes and uh, and the camp management cluster are the one who will stay and uh, support throughout this uh, the care and maintenance period to enable the transition of an emergency shelter to a home so um, i was just uh, hoping for engagement and uh, an investment in uh, that kind of transition thanks a lot uh, if i could make one comment a final thing to respond to that i think it's very important what you say and it brings up the point one is what are the best designs for camps? And I think site planning and the site camp design issue is one that I would be more than happy to discuss with somebody because I think we need to think about how camp designs can be supportive of all the other support activities, the protection and the other things. And I'm not sure that that's happening, but that's one. Second is you brought up the really important connection between that which is humanitarian and development assistance. And after the too many years, I have a gray beard. I'm actually only 14, but I've gotten my, my gray beard from all this experience of having to deal with institutions <laughs> that are really not prepared to accept or receive the responsibility that they have from a humanitarian start 
into a development approach. And if we're looking at the ministries of urban development or environment or these other places, how well are they prepared to be able to provide the support, the longer term needs that are there that I think you know uh, is really required. And, and that kind of nexus between the two is very, very uh, important. And you bring up a very important point. What is the continuity and how do we accomplish that? Over. Thanks, Earl. Um, and thanks for the question, Jorn. Um, and we're going to have to move on, sadly. It's a, it's a massive and interesting topic. But a uh, big thanks to Alex and Chuck and Earl for an excellent presentation and for sharing that information with us. One of the other really important topics that's been